little while ago, uh, Linus Torvalds was interviewed and he said, my job really is at the end of the day to say no. Somebody has to say no to this patch, this pull request, and because developers know that if they do something that I'll say no to, they do a better job of writing the code. I think that we can argue that Linus Torvalds is uh, one, of, one of the greatest minds in the industry. And I find it, uh, I find it disheartening that one of the greatest minds in the industry has been effectively reduced to a to a gatekeeper, somebody who says yay or nay about uh, about software being included uh, into a code base, and that's one of the reasons that uh, I feel that this plugin oriented programming approach is a good idea. It helps solve some of these problems. The next quote that I've got uh, is my own, uh, but POP allows for code bases to be externally augmented. Plugin oriented programming takes the idea of, well, we should make software that can have plugins, but extends it to a whole new level, meaning that it's easy for us to externally augment software. That means that instead of contributions being something that is uh, potentially a burden on the maintainership team, they can also, or sorry, they can instead uh, be, be completely separate code bases, which makes the maintainership of software much easier, but it also can make the contribution of software much easier. And then finally, plugin oriented programming has begun to be adopted uh, by uh, the uh, Fun2 project and by some of the tools instead of Gen2. So despite it being a very young uh, paradigm and project, we are also already starting to see some uh, adoption. And so Daniel Robbins, the creator of uh, Gen2 and Fun2, uh, recently said to me, plugin-oriented programming is becoming a virus because it's taking over my code and killing off weak patterns. I have a lot of code that sort of reached its potential with just modules and classes and was just sitting there waiting for something like this. As I continued to develop and work on plugin-oriented programming, these scenarios really emboldened me and made me want to continue developing this paradigm. Well, I should start by saying that I'm currently presenting an alternative programming paradigm. That's an incredibly bold thing to say. And so I want to start this presentation by talking a little bit about, uh, very, very briefly, <laughs> a little bit about the history of programming paradigms. When we look at programming paradigms, they really started in a way to express mathematics. This is where we end up with programming paradigms, particularly such as procedural and functional programming. And these paradigms uh, began to be used not just for mathematics in the early, early days of software, uh, but also in the development of some of these foundational pieces of software that we still conceptually have today, like operating systems. We go back and uh, we still write operating system kernels using procedural software and procedural approaches, albeit very modular approaches. And then after the development of uh, Unix in 1969 and its uh, fulfillment, one could say, in the early 70s, we ended up with a wonderful thing called the Unix philosophy. The Unix philosophy states that uh, the optimal way to make software and to scale software from a human development perspective, as well as a usage perspective, is to be able to have lots of different pieces of software that can interoperate in a smooth way. From a Unix perspective, that makes a lot of sense because everybody has this had the same interface, right? It was every, everything was just running on a shell. And so that philosophy was an expression of the shell, but at the same time, that Unix philosophy is what has facilitated and allowed large scale open source software to be developed because it allows us to have lots of small software projects, which can be developed by individuals or small teams, which is, as we've seen, one of the most scalable ways to write software. But then in the nineties, we saw the rise of object-oriented programming. Now, I don't want to come across as an object-oriented hater. Object-oriented programming has many fantastic qualities, but it 
rose very much so in prominence. It existed before the 90s, certainly. But it rose in prominence largely because it's a really good way to write desktop GUIs. Uh, it's a fantastic way to write GUIs. And that, that's what we wrote in the 90s. Lots of desktop GUIs. And we had the rise of Windows. And as such, this view of creating a desktop became much more dominant. And so as we started to create desktop software, we started to see more and more very large monolithic pieces of software being developed. Well, the modern era of software has diverged yet again, but in doing so, it's combined a lot of the concepts that we've had historically. We still run our web and SaaS applications very dominantly on Linux systems. And our open source software and the many little components of software that we develop, that we have now is much more the ecosystem that we work with, much more so than the days of the 90s and the early 2000s when it was when the world was much more dominated by desktop software. And so as such, we've seen a resurgence in interest in programming paradigms because the way in which we develop software has changed in many respects. And the teams and the mechanisms that we develop software has changed. And especially in the days of COVID, the massive distribution of teams is a completely new thing in the sheer universality of it. As we no longer even have people <laughs> congregating in offices, and, and, and I just wish I had more whiteboards. <laughs> so we end up with problems that exist today, problems that I would argue that object-oriented programming has a limited approach and appeal to. Problems where we run into scale issues with open source software development. Um, problems with pull requests and maintaining software projects for long periods of time. And so what we end up with is a situation where, um, like I was saying at the beginning, we end up with a situation where the people who create very powerful platforms end up, in a certain extent, being chained to them uh, through tasks of maintainership. Uh, I'm endlessly amazed at how many open source uh, founders of large projects become bogged down and really emotionally and um, time-wise burdened with the maintainership of these large projects. And so on one hand, I should say, I love the contribution as much as the next guy. But on the other hand, when you receive anywhere from 30 to 200 pull requests every day, it becomes a quite daunting challenge to keep on top of that workflow. And it also turns into a disservice to the contributor. The contributor comes in and uh, for many, many projects, pull requests sit in the queue. Sometimes for months, I've seen pull requests in some projects sit for many years. And so again, it becomes very difficult. The next problem that we run into is testing. Our software is becoming larger and more monolithic. We're diverting from uh, the Unix philosophy in a big way. And so monolithic software is harder and harder to test. It's harder and harder to validate. Therefore, if we want to make software that's easier to test and easier to develop at scale, we would need to make things less monolithic in nature. Now we've started to make changes like this with uh, things like uh, Kubernetes and microservices. Uh, but uh, the argument I'd like to present today is that we can go further and that we can uh, create paradigms in which uh, we don't have to be bound to software needing to have extremely complex runtimes to be executable, but we can still make it natively pluggable, malleable, and lots of small parts. Another thing I'd like to mention is a book that was written in 1974. And uh, they, they used to make you read this in college. So, I mean, I'm, I, I guess I'm getting old because a lot of the younger folks I talked to, they, they were never told to read the mythical man month. 
The Mythical Man Month explains, uh, it was written to managers in the 70s to say, well, you've been managing an assembly line and now you have to manage software engineers. It's very different. Uh, a problem many managers still struggle with today. <laughs> And this book goes on to explain that uh, on a production line, if you have three people building something and you want to double output, you hire three more people and make another production line. But in software, if you have a single software project and three people are writing it and you want to double output and you hire three more people, you're not going to double output. Uh, and this is a problem which is still plagues us today. Uh, but I think I would argue that, uh, again, a change in paradigm approach, what uh, we're trying to do with plugin-oriented programming is overcome that limitation. And then the last thing I'd like to say is to talk a little bit about freedom. Freedom is what we made open source for in so many ways. We created open source so that we would be able to have more freedom as software developers so that we would be able to have and share code. But at the same time, in many ways, we haven't had freedom from licenses. In many ways, we've seen ourselves um, uh, beholden to supporting software that uh, we're not compensated for as software engineers. Uh, we end up supporting software for businesses and companies and uh, merging pull requests, which don't drive necessarily drive the software vision forward, uh, but instead giving into giving into community or user pressures, uh, and then being bound to a pull request queue, as opposed to having the freedom to create more, which is so often what people who start open source projects want to do is create more software. And so this is where plugin oriented programming tries to bring an answer to these challenges. Now I mentioned briefly at the beginning that plugin oriented programming is a programming is a very new programming formalized programming paradigm. I don't want to get in front of everybody and uh, make it sound like I'm saying that uh, we've never made plugins before heavens. Uh, plugins and modular programming has long been a very good way to approach software. But plugin oriented programming is a paradigm that formalizes plugins with the idea of saying maybe we could make a system so that we don't have to reinvent plugins every time we write a piece of software. Maybe we can make a system where not just a, a certain aspect of the code is modular. But what if the entire piece of software was fundamentally modular and fundamentally pluggable? That it wasn't only comprised entirely of plugins, but also that that code itself was pluggable one with another and natively. So that like the Unix philosophy that said, well, everything is a text stream. So as long as we input and output text streams, any two pieces of software can merge together. What if we had a programming paradigm and model where the mere use of the model created seamless interoperability with every other piece of software that followed that model? Then we would have not only software which is modular in and of its own right, which is a wonderful benefit to have, but the entire software stack that we're delivering becomes modular and modular with arbitrary other pieces of software. And so we wanted to revive the Unix philosophy. The Unix philosophy says, do one thing and do it well, which leads to your software components being small and concise, easy to maintain, easy to audit, easy to secure, easy to develop, and easy to keep community rallied around because if your code base is only 5,000 lines of code, you don't need to maintain a massive pull request queue. Releases become easy. Tests become easy and fast for that code. And as long as you follow rules, which are well established today about maintaining public accessible interfaces, 
then that code can maintain interoperability with other code in a seamless way. So do one thing and do it well. Write programs that work well together so that they can interoperate with foreign software. This, again, used to be easy when the only interaction between foreign software happened to be a shell. But plugin-oriented programming introduces a concept called app merging. App merging means that any two pieces of software written using plugin-oriented programming, again, can just be merged seamlessly together with only a couple of lines of code to denote that they, that they exist in a single coherent unit. And then the entire stack of those applications functionality can be merged. Sim subsequently, the last of the three rules of the Unix philosophy, again, was all software can communicate with each other over text streams because text streams were universal. But the concept of app merging inside of plugin-oriented programming gives us the idea that they, these pieces of software communicate with each other through a completely unified model that exists inside of the, inside of the programming language itself, meaning that uh, it's always fast, it's always efficient, and we don't have to worry about a lot of the issues that we run into in creating interoperability between pieces of software, which is I must say, a very serious and uh, legitimately difficult problem that we deal with today is software interoperability. So um, I'm the original author of plugin-oriented programming. The, the community around it is growing significantly, which has been really exciting to watch. We've, we've now got con contributions and regular contributions into the plugin-oriented programming ecosystem, despite the fact that, again, it was announced last November. Uh, we've we've got uh, closing in on about 50 people who are actively contributing, uh, which is really fast for for its youth. So when I started working on plugin oriented programming, uh, I didn't start working on it with the intent of creating a programming paradigm. Uh, for those of you who are aware, my name is Thomas Hatch. Uh, I am the original creator of Salt and the Salt Stack Company. And SALT is a uh, very, very widely used uh, automation platform. Inside of SALT, I created a plugin system because, again, plugin designs are good designs. We ended up using that plugin system for a very significantly large portion of the code base inside of SALT. And so that plugin system, after a few years, I took a look at it and I thought, boy, wouldn't it be nice if I had a standalone plugin system? I'd love to be able to reuse this thing. And so I wrote a standalone plugin system, and uh, it looked a lot like the one inside of Salt. And I realized I didn't like it very much. Um, after using Salt's plugin system for years, of course, we'd run into a number of limitations and challenges. And so I thought, well, why don't I just have fun, you know, on the weekends and uh, rework this model over and over and over again? And so uh, I would more or less for fun over and over again, I kept creating this, uh, this plugin system. I uh, created four or five different versions of it until I got to the point where I realized that uh, I had actually created a programming paradigm, uh, which was when uh, I changed the name of what I'd been working on to plugin-oriented programming. Uh, and uh, then released plugin-oriented programming last year. Uh, we also started to use it uh, at SaltStack for a number of our newer projects. So all of our new pieces of software that we're developing are, are based on plugin-oriented programming, and we've seen significant benefit using it. And so this isn't something that uh, I just cooked up one night in the basement. This is something that has gone, undergone significant scrutiny a uh, fair amount of people have reviewed it. Uh, it's uh, in production, to be honest. Uh, we've, we've got uh, pop projects in production at this point in thousands of data centers. So this, again, this is, this is something which has been growing underneath the, uh, under the hood and more or less uh, silently for the last few years. And again, that we only really formalized very recently. And so again, it's uh, really exciting to see it get to the point where, where I'm able to, to talk about what we're trying to do. 
with plugin oriented programming. So I've talked a lot about these high level concepts of plugin oriented programming. Uh, but let me talk very briefly about how to create a plugin oriented project and how we can uh, very easily step into using plugin oriented software. And so uh, let's see. Whoop. This is when things get tricky as I. Uh, There we go. It's not difficult at all. Pull up a shell. All right. So let's say that we want to make a new project using plugin oriented programming. I'll call it Poppy because I, I guess I'm not very creative with names today. Some, some days I'm better than others. So plugin-oriented programming is implemented in Python. Uh, you can think of it uh, similarly to uh, C++ as an extension of C. Plugin-oriented programming is based on Python, runs on Python. Uh, I would love to see it implemented in other languages. Um, but, uh, heck, I'm a Python guy, and it was uh, a really, really reasonable way to build a paradigm. Python gives you so much flexibility. But so you can pip install pop, and whammo, you've got uh, plugin-oriented programming. It comes with a tool called popseed. Now, popseed, if we run popseed poppy, we create a lovely uh, little uh, plugin-oriented programming project takes care of a lot of the boilerplate for you, gives you a setup.py that's always going to work, um, and a few other things that we'll talk about. As soon as I uh, run this, I can say, all right, execute my uh, run.py. Uh, the setup.py gives you this little file called a run.py, which contains all the code that needs to exist outside that isn't a plugin. So we kind of have to bootstrap into a plugin environment, but but don't worry. Bootstrapping into a fully pl plugin oriented programming environment takes that much code. It's not complicated. Um, and I'll and I'll dive in and explain this uh, here in a moment. But as you could see, when we ran this, it just spat out Poppy works. So what happened? If we take a look at, uh, at our run.py here that we executed, uh, again, pretty standard Python, doesn't look too crazy. We import pop.hub. Uh, we've got a start function, uh, which we, of course, are invoking down here. And then we create an object called a hub. Inside a plugin oriented programming, a hub, the hub is, you can think of it like a really big hierarchical self variable. It gives you a palette to create a hierarchical structure for all of the plugins which you implement uh, to be made available, as well as all of the data relative to those plugins to be made available. And so once we have the hub, the hub gets what we call plugin subsystems. So to have plugin design, we've got to be able to have multiple, multiple interfaces which contain different types of plugins. And that's really how we end up breaking down plugin oriented code. So when we create a hub, it comes with a plugin subsystem already called pop, which gives us all of our tools, which allows us to have turtles all the way down. And so if we want to add a new plugin subsystem, we would just say, all right, on the hub, I'm going to reference my pop plugin subsystem. Um, in there, I'm going to reference the plugin called sub and call the function add. And then say, give me a new plugin subsystem named poppy. As soon as we run this function, a new 
plugin subsystem has been made available onto the hub, in this case called Poppy, of course. That's the name of our project. That's the name of the first plugin subsystem that we add to it. Poppy now has a plugin called init. An initial, uh, the init.py or the init plugin is the initializer for a plugin subsystem. So similar to the construction and initialization of a class, when we create a plugin subsystem, we can define how that plugin subsystem is going to function inside of an initializer. And we'll take a look at that initializer here in a moment. And then we call the CLI function in that initializer. So again, what we're looking at is that all code inside of the paradigm is referenced hierarchically. Now, there's a lot of benefits that come to, rep to hierarchical representation of code, and we'll, we'll see how far I can get in my uh, remaining 15 minutes. And so let's take a look at, uh, uh, at where this code is. If we look at the code structure, it's written in Python, and so I have to abstract a Python um, package first off. And then my actual plugin subsystem that I was talking about called Poppy is in this Poppy uh, directory inside of my Python plugin. And here's my init.py. As I take a look at my init.py, there's the CLI function that I just referenced on the hub. One of the things that's really nice about uh, using a hierarchical model is that it's very easy to track where code is in your code base. If I say, like I just did, hub.poppy.init.cli, I know that there is an init plugin which contains a function, CLI, um, inside of a Poppy subsystem. And so it makes it easier to find the source of the code that I'm trying to call. Uh, which is a traditional challenge for some people in uh, object-oriented programming. But so as, as you can see here, this is where we say print Poppy works and therefore the software functions. The software, this application only, I mean, this is the entirety of the code inside of it. Uh, but there's a number of other problems that have to be solved. If we want to merge multiple pieces of software together, so that a complete application stack can be fundamentally just merged into another application. We also need to merge the initialization of that software stack. The initialization of an application involves the setup of basic services, as well as the ingestion of configuration. So we need the ingestion of configuration options across multiple applications to be unified. POP provides this so that you never have to write command line parsing, config file parsing, operating system variable gathering. That You never have to deal with that crap again. Okay? And if you write an application, then all of that information about how your application loads its configuration can be initialized by a merging application. So let's take a quick look at how, at how that works. So again, in a, in a nutshell, if I want to facilitate merging multiple applications together, I have to allow config loading to be merged together. So with, with the code that you're looking at there, if I say Python run help, we see that this application has a significant amount of... Um, uh, command line options already applied to it. And so for each pop project, we've got a file called the conf.py. The conf.py allows us to add configuration to these systems. And if we look at the configuration loading problem, um, the configuration loading problem is a pain in the neck because you traditionally get configuration options from four locations. And those locations are command line flags, operating system variables, defaults, and config files. They have to be prioritized in a specific order. That order being command line flags, um, then OS variables, then config file options, uh, and then defaults. 
Well, if we're using Python, for instance, you define your defaults with your command line flags, which means that you then have to write a system that over that loads a config file after you've read your command line flags, figures out which command line flags were passed and which were defaults, which aren't necessarily exposed easily by arg parse, and then only overwrite the defaults. And then after you've overridden the defaults, manually parse your operating system variables that you want to expose and then shove those into the right mix. Obviously, that's a pain in the neck and something that, frankly, we should never have to do again as long as we live. And so what we do inside of plugin-oriented programming is that we are able to specify a configuration option. That's my, uh, my again, my super creative naming juices aren't flowing today. I'm going to be using a lot of Foo, Bob, Chuck, Bar. All right. So let's do this. And so we can easily specify a command line system. So we add it to the config, which means that if any other application merges in this application, the config options in config are going to be made available to the foreign application in this own application's own namespace. And so now, we can expose Bob on the command line there run help again, and there it is. Which means that the addition of that parsing becomes very easy. If, for instance, I wanted to also be able to pull it from an OS variable. And now we, all, we are also able to pull this configuration variable from an OS variable, and it all shows up in a consistent place. When I come back and take a look at this init.py, you saw that there was one line in here that says, hey, can you, can you load up the config? If I wanted to merge multiple applications together and they're config together, when I say load here, this is a list, and I would just add another application, right? So I could just say, you know, I want to, I want to add all the options from the corn program too, or, uh, you know, let's see, what's another one? Uh, there's item, um, or another pop project. It's heist, and then all of a sudden, I've got the uh, all the configuration options for those applications as well, and then when those get loaded. They get presented on a hierarchical namespace. So I can come back and print whoop, an object that we add on the hub called opt. And we can see that that object um, is abstracted as a dictionary. It's a, uh, I mean, it's, it's set up as a, immutable object because, you know, you should be mucking about with uh, config options. But, yep, it's got a top-level dictionary called Poppy, and there is Bob. And if I run Bob, oh, and it's true now. So you've got config loading. All right. One of the next challenges that we run into with what I'm talking about, this idea of lots of plugins, and lots, and, and, and it lends itself again to lots of merging projects. You come back and say, oh man, deploying that software is going to be a nightmare. And then, oh, and you chose Python. And we all know that deploying software with Python is a nightmare, despite the fact that who doesn't love Python syntax? I guess people who like brackets more than they should. But uh, uh, that, that, was, that was a joke. 
one of the challenges, with, again, with these online presentations is normally I try and make people laugh, but I can't see or hear anybody. <laughs> so, uh, so POP also ships with a system that allows you to distribute software. Ah, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, oh, oh, Sam, you're wonderful. <laughs> So, uh, so POP presents a system that strives to solve that problem. Now, uh, in the world of Python, uh, we've got the problem of writing code that, uh, that attaches to a, a version of system Python, dealing with dependencies. And of course, the paradigm I'm presenting, again, it really suggests that uh, we should be able to have a lot of control over our dependencies. And so there is a bet. Now that I'm thinking about it, I've got a development version of pop build on here. Um, so there's a tool that uh, uh, you can also install to extend pop called pop build. Pop build creates single binaries or single portable directories of Python projects. Um, I know that uh, freezing a Python project is nothing new. Pop build actually uh, leverages PyInstaller because after spending a lot of time researching this, uh, our conclusion was that those guys just did the best job. Um, uh, but of course, it's, it's built on Pop, so it's pluggable. So we could use something else if you want. Um, heavens, uh, plugins are great. Any, any component can always just be replaced. So, so Pop build goes in and actually bypasses a bunch of the problems that you run into with PyInstaller, uh, meaning that so far uh, with, uh, with more recent versions of pop build, uh, I'd say for the last two months, um, I haven't been able to find a project that pop build can't just build and it doesn't work. Uh, I'm strongly considering writing a piece of software that would basically pip install Python projects as single binaries, because it just it just works. It's great, uh, which would get rid of. I, I mean, they're a little big. Don't get me wrong, uh, but uh, but I get single Python binaries. So um, I can do pop build, and then just give it a name of my project here. And the only thing that pop build needs uh, to be able to build that single binary. Uh, is it, it's going to look for a requirements.txt file. So your, your uh, Python dependencies are still managed the same way they've always been managed. Uh, it's also going to look for that run.py file. It, it needs an entry point. Uh, so uh, for a lot of projects, I've needed to write an entry point. Most of them is two or three lines. Um, and uh, one of the things I'd really like to see is getting it better integrated with setup tools and a few other uh, Python build systems so that it can much more natively pick up, right, figure out um, what we're going to be doing for that, uh, for that single, um, uh, to, to auto-generate the entry point is one of the things that I'd like to get in there. Um, because again, uh, usually uh, I'll download a Python project if I want to make it into a single binary. Just download a Python project, take a look at its entry point, and then just write a little run.py that says import foo, and then foo.function, and run pop build, and you're done. Okay, so now we've got this poppy, and uh, we, we can run that thing. And phew, demo worked especially after I talk it up and everything. This poppy is completely self-contained in that it has, it has Python in there, um, which means that, yes, the binary is big. It's uh, much bigger than what you get from a Go binary. I mean, that's, that's 20 megs. Um, there are a number of things that we can do to shrink that binary that we're still working on. Um, uh, at the end of the day, I strongly suspect that we should be able to get that binary size down to between about seven and 10 megs. All right. So 
that's a very, very quick and brief introduction into uh, using pop seed um, and into uh, pop. Now, there are a few more things that I want to mention. This is really just a, this presentation is intended to say, hey, we've got a new way of, we've, we've got a new way of looking at writing code. And 45 minutes isn't enough time to introduce the breadth of a programming paradigm. And um, to the extent that I, I haven't even been able to talk about vertical lab merging and horizontal lab merging uh, and introduce you to a number of additional projects that are out there. Uh, so normally I would talk about uh, the REND project if I had more time uh, because it's a really, really easy way to introduce. Uh, there's another project out there called Corn, which generates um, a list of just system attributes. Uh, and, and a large list of system attributes across all, all major Linux distributions, Windows, Mac, and even Solaris and AIX, um, as we, we've already received contributions for those, which uh, is interesting. <laughs> and I uh, talked to you about how vertical app merging means that one of those plugin subsystems, it's really a bucket that contains plugins, which means that somebody can make their own project that contains plugins for a subsystem you made to extend that subsystem's functionality, which means that they don't have to wait for you to merge that pull request. They can make their project, put it up on PyPy, install it, and it and it can and it just works. You just turn it on, and wham, they've ex they've extended the system because plugins, man. Um, which also means that when they publish their own code to, to vertically extend your code, or you publish code to vertically extend somebody else's code, you don't have to wait for a release. You don't have to wait for a merge. You can say, my code's stable. I know it works against these versions. I'm going to publish it, and we're good to go. And, uh, and, and hopefully it makes things much more fluid. Hopefully it makes things easier for contributors, again, to extend projects. And they can do it without having to go through the gauntlet that a project has rightfully set up to defend itself from, from uh, introducing bad code. But at the same time, those contributors are able to um, function more autonomously, and they're able to maintain their own code in the long run. All right. So... Uh, I'm, I'm, I believe I'm just about out of time. <laughs> and so the last thing that I'll say is if you're interested in learning more about plugin-oriented programming, uh, you can uh, go check out the repository. It's currently on GitLab slash SaltStack slash pop. Um, oh, goodness. I could have sworn I put this in this slide. There is also a, a, a book online that explains the paradigm and gives more examples and, and explanations around usage of pop. Uh, it's, uh, a po it's a Python, pro or sorry, it's, uh, it's a project called Pop Book. And you can find that at popbook.readthedocs.io. And so what we end up, and, and so you can go and check it out. It's not a very long book. I mean, you could probably, uh, consume it in, in, in an afternoon. It's about 50 pages. Uh, but it goes over the fundamentals of how to think in pop, idea, more of the ideas about where it came from. So thank you all for listening and coming. Uh, again, I, I, I can't tell you how excited I am as, I, as I've seen this paradigm. Again, we released it six months ago. Not even that. Five and a half months ago is when we publicly announced pop. Um, yes, that is it. Thank you, Robert. Um, yeah, so only only a few months ago, and we're already getting a, a sizable amount of usage. Um, and it's it's interesting; you wouldn't see it from activity on the uh, on the repos itself, which is actually a testament to the fact that it's working. Uh, I'm I'm just really excited how many times uh, people are reaching out, and more and more of these presentations people are attending, 
and I'm hearing about more and more projects spinning up. All right. Thank you all for uh, listening to my talk. Uh, I'll be I'll, I'll be wherever it is I'm supposed to be in this conference afterwards for 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 Q and A. <laughs> I'll figure that out. Okay. Thank you. Adios.